Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! Again. We're here! <laughs> Again. Every time. Yeah, I'm that's, just that's, not getting rid of this. That, that's an every week thing from here on, buddy. <laughs> so how's it going? So those of you that haven't turned off now. <laughs> um, <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm doing okay. Yeah. Um, I, I had a I had a dentist appointment this morning. My mouth kind of hurts. But I'm hoping that the whiskey will make up for that. Ah, did you whoosh it around in your mouth? Oh, always. Okay. <laughs> I like the way it tastes. Yeah, well. I'm a fan of whiskey. Oh, awesome. Um... Well, okay, so the moment is finally here. So you're all whiskeyed up for our talk on Flynn? Yeah, uh, well, I'm not exactly whiskeyed up yet. We'll oh. see where we are by the end of the podcast. <laughs> right. Should have brought the whole bottle in. No doubt. Um, we're, so. And by the way, just to throw this out there, that, uh, you know, a lot of times you get what you pay for, um, but there are, you know, special little gems out there in the in the cheap shelves at the liquor store. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, what we're drinking tonight is, uh, you know, I really ought to wait until we have some kind of sponsorship from these things before I plug them, (laughs) but maybe if I make it clear how much I like some of these things, they'll contact us. Who knows? Um, but we're, uh, we're drinking Rittenhouse rye. It's like a really old, um, bottled in bond rye whiskey from, uh, from Pennsylvania. Um, and it is an excellent whiskey, uh, at a hundred proof and it is a $25 bottle. Yes, it is. It's my go-to, yeah. especially like if I know I'm doing like a hard night of drinking. Written house <laughs> all the way, man. Like it's, it's hard to cheap. do a hard night of drinking. It's a hundred hundred proof bottle. Well, that's um, what I'm saying. Like it'll get you there. <laughs> oh yeah, it'll get you there. <laughs> yep, and it's cheap. No. Um, before we really get into the Flynn stuff, though, I did want to. Um, and I, I've gotten some positive. Uh, reactions to our last podcast even though when we were done i was like i don't think i explained that very well um how we're different oh, uh, yeah. but um we did get a few questions and so forth and and this is what i would like to say about that um and little debates that i had with people around yeah. me also um and hopefully i can make it like really succinct this time because i've had plenty of Some opportunity to, to to mull it over yeah well i had to keep making the case so i think i've gotten better <laughs> at it yeah um it uh, so it seems to me that everybody and and i mean really everybody is so ensconced in the system that exists that they can't really imagine a system outside of what exists yeah um in terms of government police government courts and you know we've addressed government courts more times than government police i think on this podcast but um this is this is the part that i want to that i want to make clear is that all these things that we talk about, um, private security, uh, you know, arbitration, etc., all of these systems of private security and private um, courtrooms, uh, of, of a kind anyway, they already exist. Yeah. Right here in this country. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. They already exist. So you're not actually just like throwing out the entire system. You've got a, a private version of these things that already exists in this country. And people go to them because they work better than the government system. I've ran for many a rent a cop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. You spend enough time on the beach, you're going to run from a rent a cop at some point. <laughs> yeah. Or running around through you know, higher end neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. Middle class neighborhoods. It's always happened to me at the beach, but you know, I'm sure higher end neighborhoods have them too. Yeah. Well, and there were some places that weren't exactly higher end that I lived in in Atlanta where they had their own. Rent a cops. Yeah, exactly. But um, anyway, the, the point is that we're not talking about going, this isn't as radical as it sounds. Yeah. Um, I mean, these things already exist. I mean, you're just, all you would be doing would be dissolving, what's currently there and and well no the not private even. sector would move in you'd be dissolving the government version of what's well yeah currently yeah well there. that's what i mean yeah um, the government version of and and even if you just pared back the government from mm-hmm. some of it i mean that's and and moved more of it into private you could do it in phases yeah you know 
Maybe. Yeah. I, I See, I don't like phases very much because what ends up happening, it seems to me most of the time, yeah. um, is that uh, you talk about launching the first phase and you never even get that far. Yeah. Well, uh, you're probably right about so that. Because there's so much resistance that yeah. you know, it just doesn't happen at all. And nobody ever finds out that it's better the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as the court system is concerned, like, th- and uh, this is the one that people really bristle at. And this is yeah. the one that I think is far more. It's it's the worst part. I mean, well, I, I don't yeah. know. Police are pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I, the courts are pretty insidious, though, in yeah. that they, um, you know, and I would say that the, the police and to a, a great degree, actually, the municipal court system, too, mm-hmm. um, exist primarily, I think. Um, to generate revenue for their municipality. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, you know, but I think that the court system, while it's, it's uh, there's no incentive for a government court system to um, let anybody go because the more fines they can collect, the better. Well, and the more they can keep you in court, the better because you have all those court fees too. And they just work, hand, the, the police and the courts just work too closely hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Like there's, I mean, you have the same cops coming in week after week with the same judges week yeah. after week, and there's they're just too close to one another. Yeah. Well, it's worse than that even. It's not even yeah. just the cops, the prosecutors. Oh, it's the yeah. same prosecutors coming in week after week too. Exactly. The state prosecutors and the, and the uh, judges are, tend to be buddy-buddy. Yeah, I didn't even consider that, but you're absolutely um, right. Um, and even when you get into that stuff, and, and remember this for later in the podcast when we get in uh, deeper into the flint. Oh, yeah, this leads us right into um, Flynn. But, uh, like, 97% of cases at the federal level are uh, plead out. Yep. Um, And it's, like, close to 95% at the state level. Uh, So, you know, the whole idea of getting your day in court doesn't happen for most people. Yeah. Um, So, and then there's a a huge... There's, like, something roughly around 10% of uh, capital crimes... um, that have been uh, exonerated, like proven to be innocent, pled guilty. Yeah. Well, and a, lo- a big reason, I don't know, just from the outside looking in, that I would think that people plead guilty to crimes they know they didn't commit is because it's just too difficult to fight it. And you'll spend just as much time in jail fighting it as if you just plead guilty to it and move on about your business. Yeah. You know? Well, and we may as well just start there. Um, actually, the, like the, the sentencing is very different, too. Yeah. Um, if you plea, than if you if you fight it in court, uh, there's a risk reward type of question there. You know, besides the fact of just it being incredibly expensive to fight. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the average sentence for the same crime um, on a plea deal is uh, is one third the average sentence um, for a crime uh, convicted in a trial by jury. Yeah. So essentially, you know, like even if you know that you didn't do it, the possibility of like you feeling like maybe you just don't have enough or you can't afford a good enough yeah. attorney. But if you don't feel like you have enough evidence, like you just happen to be at home alone with no alibi and no way of proving your um, whereabouts at the time of the crime. Um, and you think, well, a jury could kind of go either way on it or you can't afford an attorney that's that can fight it. Yep. Um then, uh, you know, if you're, yeah, like a lot of defense attorneys and especially court appointed ones, they're not, they just don't care well, that much. It's a whole lot easier for them to just plead. But the idea of spending, um, 30 years in jail instead of 10 years in jail, like, yeah, you know, like, I can still get out and still have some of my life left. Exactly. You know, um, and, and as far as like with the court appointed versus the uh, regular attorney, I mean, Coin point attorneys are great and one all, but they're not what you can buy as far as going and getting a real attorney. Um, you're just not going to get as far with a court appointed as you will. I mean, your odds yeah. just aren't as good. And it's, it's not, better than nothing because at least they know at the least they procedures. Know, but, and we've talked to some of these attorneys that mm-hmm. do that do both and mm-hmm. um, what or have done have done both. Yeah. Um, and what I've gathered just in the conversations with them is basically when you use a court appointed, you're basically just getting the lawyer aspect. You're mm-hmm. not getting the evidence gathering and all this stuff, putting it together on your behalf. Mm-hmm. You're basically getting somebody in, in the courtroom that day to represent you and make sure you don't get raked over the coals by the law. Yeah. But no, you're not getting the evidence collected and all the, all the other stuff that a good attorney will do for you. Yeah. 
the resources that a good attorney has. Yeah, so. absolutely. So um, just like I said, bear that in mind as we start to talk about this Flynn thing, because, well, uh, as a background, I think most of us know at this point yeah. um, that uh, <laughs> General Flynn had been um, the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency under Obama. Um, only for a couple of years, though, they butted heads yeah. a bit. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit more later. But um, the the reason that he has been in the news so much is that he was the incoming, was it defense secretary? I think it was defense secretary, right? Yes. Uh, I, for the I Trump so. administration. Yeah. Um, I got stuck between state and defense. I, but Tillerson was state, right? So, yeah, yeah. So Flynn was defense. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was investigating, uh, like the basics of it really, I mean, if we start early, is that the FBI had an investigation open against him, um, leaked information to the Washington Post that Flynn was not under investigation, uh, dropped by for a casual visit to the White House and did an interview with, with Michael Flynn um, about a conversation that he had had with... Um, Sergei Kislyak, who is the ambassador uh, from Russia, before he'd actually entered office. Well, I, this is after the election, but before the inauguration okay. yeah. um, that the conversation took place. And they asked him if he had discussed the, um, the uh, sanctions and the expulsion of um, diplomats and nationals that Obama had done on his way out. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys recall, this is the end of 2016. Um, o Obama uh, had levied a bunch of sanctions against Russia and kicked out a bunch of diplomats. Yep. Um, I from remember Russia. that, yeah. And uh, so um, the FBI asked uh, Flynn if he had discussed those sanctions and those expulsions with Sergei Kislyak when he had talked to him. And um, apparently uh, he had said no when he had, in fact, discussed those sanctions. Yeah. Um, and so later on, uh, Flynn, I would say under some duress, um, pled guilty to one count of lying to the FBI related to this particular event. And that's yeah. where it stood for yeah. a, a long time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the the guilty plea was had been pending in all this time. There was some discussion about whether Trump would pardon him, but he never did. Um, but the Justice Department ended up um, dismissing it. I guess it's been a month now. Yeah, it was um, about a month ago. Actually, I have the date. Oh, oh, I thought I had the date. It was in May. I think it was May 7th. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, the Justice Department finally requested dismissing all the the charge, the one charge of the lying charge, to the yeah. FBI um, against Flynn because, uh, one, the FBI didn't believe he was lying at the time and was deliberately trying to entrap him. This is the Justice Department's yeah. wording, more or less, or reasoning anyway. Yeah. And uh, two, um, his behavior in contacting the ambassador of Russia when he was the incoming uh, Secretary of Defense uh, was totally appropriate, and there was no justification for the investigation in the first place. <laughs> well, there you go. All right. So, um, but this created this weird firestorm of uh, commentary from um, old presidents <laughs> <laughs> and the media that this was the end of law and order in the United States. Oh, yeah. I heard plenty of that. Mm. What I find interesting is with um, cities on fire and uh, riotous crowds all over the place, I don't remember them saying that again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nobody said anything about law and order then. <laughs> yeah. Um, but releasing Flynn was, was it. Uh, you yeah, know, a real was... affront to justice, yeah. even though it was the Justice Department that was that requesting let him go, it. But yeah. what they'll say is that, it, well, it's Trump's Justice Department, although he didn't fire everybody in the Justice Department. And yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, there's a lot of double standard in this anyway, but we should talk about the, the real specifics. And I would actually start as early as, um, his time as the, uh, the director of the defense intelligence agency under Obama. Yeah. Um, now he got this position because he had proven to be, uh, resourceful and effective as much as anybody has been, I guess, um, in the terror war. Um, that he was a, a good analyst and he, you know, had 
used his resources wisely or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know how they. He picked worked these his people. way up through the ranks. Of, yeah. And yeah, and he drew attention for being good. For good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is again how you define good, but yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, there were he was an outspoken critic of Obama's foreign um, policy, foreign relations, yeah, foreign yeah. policy, uh, and they butted heads, and Obama did not like him, yeah, um, pretty quickly, and yeah. <laughs> fired him or forced his resignation. I don't remember exactly how that ended yeah. after two years, which is. Uh, a really short time for somebody to be in that position. Yeah. Um, now two of the big things were, uh, that Flynn, um, opposed the, the Syrian intervention, uh, the United States involving itself in Syria. Um, and for the right reason in this case that he saw it as that we were, he was like, these are the guys that we started this terror war, um, about, and now we're trying to support them. And now we're funding them. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, um, he, he knew that the, the moderate quote unquote, uh, rebels in Syria were actually Al Qaeda offshoots. And in some cases actually just like Al Qaeda guys. Yeah. They were um, just same guys. They've just yeah, moved around a little bit. So it was the Syrian Al Qaeda in the case of Jabhat al-Nusra. And then there was actually like Al Qaeda and Iraq people yeah. that were also being funded. Yeah. Because they'd moved across the border. We were fighting them on one side of the border and funding them on the other side of the border. Yeah. This, this is a problem. Yeah. Um, so uh, he also opposed uh, Obama's drone war. Yeah. Not for the right reasons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah. I, I mean, but, well, and I may as well explain that, too. He um, he saw it as a lazy way of conducting war. Oh, uh, yeah. Really, I, it's the best way to describe it. Well, he... Um, you know, he's like, uh, well, it was cheap and you just kill people. And, uh, of course, you know, after the fact, we also found that something like 90% of the people killed by Obama's drone war were people that were unknown to the U S government. Like they didn't know who they were killing. Like yeah. they killed one guy and then the nine people around him, they had no idea who they were, exactly. um, which isn't really good. Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, I mean, that's not good for publicity in those countries. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, in fact, I read a quote today. Uh, and I can't remember who said it, and I should have written it down. Um, but he said the, and this isn't exactly. I mean, it's it's on point, but it's not not exactly what we're talking about here. Um, but it was something like uh, the sons of torture victims make great terrorists. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so true, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so he he wanted them to do more capturing people, sending them to Guantanamo and, and torturing them uh, for yeah, information. So, so he was a torture guy. He's not yeah. a drone guy. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, if you killed them, then you couldn't get any information out of yeah, them. Right? right. So, um, so not, still not, not, not a position that we would entirely support, but, yeah. uh, the point is that he was, um, very vocal, like publicly vocal about his problems with the way, uh, Obama was conducting the terror war. Yeah. Um, and that created some friction. And in fact, after uh, Trump hired him, uh, Obama actually contacted Trump and said, you don't want this guy, like, he's no good, <laughs> uh, essentially. So he, like, held the grudge for years. For a while, yeah. Um, right. And, of course, we've also gotten information that's come out that Obama and uh, Biden were absolutely aware of these investigations, including into Flynn. Um, and, uh, you know, o Obama has actually said something s just recently too, about how, uh, it was, you know, that releasing Flynn or dropping these charges was terrible. The guy was awful, et cetera, et cetera. He's yeah. like, still doesn't like it. <laughs> still um, grinding that X. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, let, let's go through the reasons that this is kind of absurd. Like the whole, the whole thing is kind of absurd. Um, one, it's neither unusual nor illegal for an incoming national security team to have conversations with foreign governments. Yeah. Like, this is the point of a transition team. This is why transition teams exist, is so that you can start the conversation with these other governments that you're about to have to start dealing with on behalf of the United States. I mean, it makes um, nothing but sense. Yeah. yeah. So nothing unusual about it. Um, the agents who conducted the interview that was set up as just, a, oh, we're just talking, um, even though he was actually being interrogated and was not aware, um, 
these agents uh, believed that he was cooperative and truthful and was not intentionally misleading them. Um, you know, this was a conversation that had happened months before, like remembering everything that was in it, you know. Yeah, it can um, be difficult. And in fact, he even mentioned, because he knew uh, that the National Security Agency obviously had a transcript of the conversation. They're listening to all these foreigners um, and, and their conversations as much as possible. He knew Kislyak was being... Uh, listened monitor. to by the, yeah, monitored yeah. by the NSA. I mean, we're, we were mm. monitoring Angela Merkel and she's an ally. <laughs> yeah, so <right. laughs> um, he said, uh, he said to them in the interview, oh, well, I mean, you must have a, um, a transcript of this conversation. He's like, I don't remember everything that we talked about, et cetera. You know, yeah. you must have a transcript of this, yeah. which they did, but they didn't tell him. <laughs> but they, of course they didn't tell um, him that. Yeah. And, uh, and then the, um, the documents released uh, were later released, I guess, um, showing that the FBI, uh, with their questioning, had intended to force him to lie or confess to anything um, so that they could prosecute him or get him fired or force him to resign. Yeah. Um, they were trying to get him out of office and put a black eye on the Trump administration. Yeah. Um, and that was that was the primary purpose, it seems, of the interview. Uh, and, of course, you have the, the same old people. You got... Uh, Peter Strzok and um, Lisa Page uh, as a part of this. And yeah. like how they got to this point is bizarre anyway. Um, but finally, four, uh, they apparently had allegedly, maybe I should say, mm. uh, because I, I actually got upset listening to an, um, a news piece earlier today where they said um, something had apparently happened when it was just really hearsay. So it's definitely <laughs> so they, not apparent. They, yeah, um, they didn't know. <laughs> but, uh, it seems that they um, had threatened prosecution of his son, um, of uh, General Flynn's son, um, because he uh, the 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 prosecution or the pursuance of um, any kind of prosecution against his son was dropped when he pled guilty to lying to the FBI. Oh wow! So he pled guilty, and then they stopped any investigation into his son. So it's a little this for that. Yeah. Um, and of course that is, uh, that has to do with, um, that he was, um, you know, doing things on behalf of, I think it was Turkey, uh, yeah. while he was part of the transition team and, and so forth. Um, and he didn't disclose that he was acting on behalf of a, a foreign government or making inquiries or pushing for favors or whatever on behalf of a foreign government. This is apparently, I'm not into the DC morass, but, um, this is apparently really common that yeah. <laughs> this is something that happens all the time that people are, are doing things um, at request of foreign government and not declaring it like they're supposed to. And it's almost yeah. never prosecuted. Yeah. Right. Um, so those are the, the main things. Now, when you start to get into the details, um, you know, the, the reason that they were able to start the investigation at all um, is because uh, of the Carter page stuff, the FISA stuff with Carter Page, which, of course, we know in the end resulted in absolutely no charges, none whatsoever against Carter Page, and that he had actually been working as a CIA informant, and the FBI knew that and altered documents to make that unclear. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you not hear that stuff? No. Okay, so that came out a while back that um, the, the FBI had actually taken some phrases out of some emails uh, from the CIA yeah. about Carter Page where they said that he's an asset of ours. <laughs> really? And they had altered the emails yeah. when they submitted the information to the FISA court for approval oh, for the wow. surveillance. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that came out a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, then, as I said, that they had leaked uh, information to the Washington Post. Don't believe anything you read in the Washington Post. Yeah. Verify <laughs> um, that they were not investigating uh, General Flynn, which is why it was so casual to him and he didn't bother to call an attorney, um, although everything should have gone through the White House counsel and it hadn't. Um, yeah. But he was willing to uh, participate in this questioning um, because as far as he was concerned, it was just a conversation. Yeah. Um, which is also probably why the agents that were involved in the interrogation said that they thought that he was being truthful and cooperative. Yeah. Um, because they were probably on the same page with it just being a... Well, no, they knew because, the, yeah. you know, this is one of those bits of uh, the documentation that came out that 
prompted the Justice Department to drop oh, so they the charges. Oh, so they knew they were trying to put the screws to him. Though. Yeah, they yeah. they knew that they were trying to, to entrap him. Entrap him, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it didn't... I mean, I guess it worked in, yeah. in, a, in a sense. Um, but so that that's the basics of it, I, I suppose. There's not really a whole lot else uh, that we can say about the... Um, the uh, the actual case. I mean, Flynn's calls with Kislyak were recorded by the NSA, and F Flynn knew it, um, saying that they must have a transcript in the FBI interview. Um, the investigation into... Uh, so here's another interesting part. The investigation into the improper relationship between Flynn and Russia uh, was actually closed early in 2017, but as a result of some bureaucratic mix-up. And, of course, it started with um, um, Clapper and Comey. Yeah. Because they always do. Yeah. Right? Those guys seems, are terrible. Seems to be where um, the trouble begins. Yes. Uh, but due to some bureaucratic mix-up, supposedly, uh, they didn't finalize the, the closing of the investigation. And they were closing the investigation because they found absolutely no evidence of any improper relationship between Flynn and Russia, by the way. Yeah. Um, but they didn't... They didn't officially close it, and that's what Peter Strzok and Lisa Page were able to seize on to continue. They they discovered that this paperwork hadn't been finalized, um, and then they pursued the, uh, you know, closed, but not actually closed, yeah. um, investigation to hinder the Trump presidency, as they said that they would. They yeah. tried their best not to get him elected. Once he was elected, they did what they could to, um, to hamstring him at every yeah. turn. And this was one of those ways that they were one of those things that they were using to hamstring him. Yeah. Um, so this should scare everybody. Yeah. All right. <laughs> like they went after a really well-known decorated general. Um, yeah. and w with every bit of corrupt power that the FBI could wield essentially in this case. And yeah. there's some on the other side too, right? Like there were some, obviously some forces within the FBI that were working to help Trump too. Yeah. Um, because there were some leaks from the FBI that also helped him, but it seems like a majority of it was against him. Yeah. And, um, and it's getting very little media coverage. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because it's that it's the wrong side. It's not <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, there's a great, um, I don't know. I guess it's a podcast that Glenn Greenwald does uh, called System Update. And uh, a month ago, roughly, um, a little over a month ago, I guess, he did a, a long episode about this Flynn thing. In fact, I, I got a lot of information out of it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I encourage people to listen to it, although. Like you got to be into this. You got to be like a, a, a news or <laughs> politics junkie like me to really enjoy it. I think because it, it is a little dry. But um, and hopefully this isn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, he, you know, goes on um, quite a bit about how one of the real problems, and or maybe it was in the article that was attached to the to the podcast. I don't remember. Um, but that these are evidentiary questions, not political questions. Yeah. Um, that whether you're on the left or the right shouldn't affect your your feelings about this. Whether yeah. you like Flynn or not shouldn't affect your feelings about this. What you yeah. ought to be able to do, no matter what side you're on, um, politically, is look at this and say, okay, there's no evidence that he did anything wrong, and that clearly they the opposing group used the power of the intelligence community um, to, try to try and end this guy's career. Yeah. And actually, they successfully and, did. And the reason they wanted to do it was so they could hurt the sitting president. Right. Like, I mean, that's right. all there is to it. Like, And it started with the Obama administration. Yeah. Um, and Obama didn't like this guy. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that played into it, and maybe not. But, yeah. I, I mean, I, it seems at, relevant. At any, at any rate, you shouldn't be able to wield the power of government to, to do something like this. Right. Like, I mean, that's yeah. the to whole... attack uh, an opposing candidate and then an opposing president elect yeah. and then eventually an opposing president, which is the reason we were against so much of the surveillance stuff and and just the government having so much power in general is because this is what comes out of that. Mm -hmm. This this is the situation you end up in when you have and it doesn't matter because I know like big government people will be like, well, that's the reason you have all these checks and balances in place and this, that, and the other. And yeah. it just doesn't work. 
Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, it it's, just doesn't. It's because the the people that are doing the bad things and the people that are supposedly checking on them are getting their paycheck from the same place. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, what is the uh, Upton Sinclair quote that um, it, it's something like uh, that um, if, uh, oh gosh, now I'm going to totally butcher this, but it, it's, essentially <laughs> it's uh, if... Um, if a per- person's ignorance of something, uh, well, a person will remain ignorant of something if their paycheck depends on them being ignorant of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's what That's not have, the quote, but it's, it's something like that. But it fits, like I yeah. say. I mean, it's definitely the situation. Yeah. So, um, so I do want to talk about, I mean, I see this as a, this is important in recognizing that at the highest levels of government and the intelligence community, um, which a lot of people support for some reason, yeah. um, there is a tremendous amount of corruption, and they are not uh, these um, impartial uh, investigators and so forth. It is very political. Oh, yeah. And, and that should be a real red flag to people. Um, yeah. That should frighten you. Um, and the answer, of course, is to take these powers away. Of course, I would just abolish the whole thing, right? Yeah, you know. right. Um, but I, I do want to use this to talk about some criminal justice issues um, because there's a few points in here that I think are important, especially in the current climate. Yeah. Um, one is that there has been a lot of talk uh, from people saying, well, if he didn't do anything wrong, why did he plead guilty? Well, I think we laid out a pretty good reason for that at the beginning of the podcast. Right. <laughs> um, exactly. It. That you're uh, likely to get three times as long a sentence if you go to jury trial and lose than if you just plea um, that around 10% of capital crimes that have been uh, proven to the people had been proven to be innocent, about 10% of those people pled guilty Yeah. Um, to a capital crime. Like we're talking, like you know. major. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And... Uh, you know, they did so because at least they might have some life left when they get out. Usually it's to avoid the death penalty, by the way. Yeah. Um, which I'm opposed to the death penalty anyway. In general, yeah. Um, I don't think the state should decide life or death. I well, think the whole that's idea dangerous. the government can kill you is a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it hasn't stopped them. Well, no, obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, there's there's a ton of reasons that the the criminal justice system is stacked for the prosecution. Yeah. Um, the prosecution has the majority of the power uh, going in. Um, and part of it is just in sentencing. Uh, but you have all the mandatory minimums. Um, they've tried to take subjectivity out of the courtroom. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that the whole point of having judges is for subjectivity, that you take the totality of the circumstances and it all goes into determining what the sentence should be. Um and there has been a big push the past couple of years to do away with the, some of that. Like yeah. there's there's a lot of talk about it, and it it needs to happen because I mean mm-hmm. that you, just like you say, the whole point of having the judge is to make like a decision about what should happen. Yeah, like, even once it doesn't make sense to s- select a judge and then tie his hands. Exactly. Um. So uh, yeah, mandatory minimums, and then there's the issue of charge stacking. And that's a big part of the plea deals Yeah, um, is that uh, it, they say, okay, if you go to trial, we're going to charge you for this and this and this and this. And sometimes it's levels of the same crime. So as opposed to um, possession with intent to sell, it becomes a conspiracy, yeah. um, you know, which holds a much higher sentence. Well, if you plead, we'll just charge you with the uh, with, uh, possession with intent to sell, um, which will be, what, you know, five or ten years or something like that. But if you go to trial, we're going to bring on the charge of uh, conspiracy, um, which is, you know, 25 to 30 or something like that. I don't, yeah. I don't know these numbers exactly. I'm just kind of making stuff up. But yeah. that's I, that's the kind of thing that they do. So the prosecution has all the power, partly in what charges they bring forth. Yeah. Um, and then there's the charge stacking issue, which a lot of times if you plead guilty, they'll just, you plead guilty su- to a single charge, yeah. um, and you get sentenced for that charge, and they, they don't bring up everything else. Whereas if you go to trial, then they bring up, you know, 10, 12 charges. Yeah. And the odds and when and part of it is is when they and the prosecution knows this, when they bring up that many charges, the odds of you being able to convince a jury that he was guilty of something becomes more and more mm-hmm. likely. 
Um, I mean, because the, in the jury's mind, they mean like, well, the first few four or five charges, I don't think so. But uh, those yeah. last three, like, I, yeah. I can see that, you yeah. know. Um, and, but that still screws you <laughs> because, like, those three mm-hmm. could be enough, you know. Yeah, it could be enough to put you away for a, a significant portion of your life. Exactly. Right. Um. So, uh, and then, of course, there's the, the threat and prosecution of his son. Yeah. I think that most fathers would just, yeah, well, where do you want me to sign? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, leave my family alone. Yeah, I, I'll go to jail for a few years. My, you know, younger yeah. son, I don't want his life to be ruined. Absolutely. Um, and that's just a thing that, that that's a kind of level of corruption that I, that I can't really articulate. Yeah. Um, well, and the scary thing is, is to, I mean, yeah, it's happening at these high levels. You mm-hmm. know, it's happening at the lower levels yeah. that me or you would end up in. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and the, the thing is, you remember, um, before the, uh, before the election, when Trump was saying, um, you know, go after these terrorists, go after their families, go after, mm-hmm. and everybody was up in arms about that. That's yeah. essentially that's what, that's exactly the, what this is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's what the prosecution did here. The, well, yeah. what the FBI did yeah. here yeah, um, is say, okay, look, if you won't admit to anything, then we're just gonna we're gonna prosecute your son instead. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and who knows how far that could have gone? Uh, yeah. We'll go after your wife. We'll go after your grandkids. I don't know if he has any grandkids, but anyway, yeah. but you get still, the point. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. and they could do that with you know any of you, and especially uh, we've talked over and over again about you know how beneficial it would be to all of us to end the drug war. Um, and this is one of those situations where it really creates these kinds of, of possibilities for prosecutors yeah. because maybe your wife or your kid, your 18 year old kid or whatever had no idea that any of this stuff was in the house. Yeah. Um, or it can go the other way too. Um, maybe your kid has it, uh, and he's underage. He's a he's a minor, and so they um, start threatening to go after the the parents, even though they had no idea that it was going on. Yeah. Um, these kind of things are are a possibility in the in the justice system as it is. Yep. And uh, about ninety seven percent of cases are pled out. Um, and then uh, you know the there's some significant detail on the remaining cases, but you are guaranteed a speedy public trial by the constitution in yeah. this country and almost nobody gets it. Yeah. No, it's, it, it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. It just, it doesn't. And that actually is another part of it is that we have so many laws that they're prosecuting in so many ways that the court systems are overloaded. Yeah. And so even if you want to, um, to fight it, you could sit in jail. Like if you've been denied bail specifically or you just can't afford it, yeah. um, you could sit in jail for a significant period of time yeah. before you yeah. get your trial. Yeah. Potentially as long as you'd b- potentially be in jail once once you're convicted. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, you end up with time served, right? Yeah, like, right. well, you already did more time than we would ever Than we would have ever in. gave you <laughs> yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I, I've read some cases and they're not they're not real common, but I've read some cases where people were in jail for up to two years yeah. um, before they finally dropped charges and let them go. Yeah, which is just insanity. But they lost their freedom for all that time. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is something that we brought up when we were talking about the right to resist. Yeah. Uh, you know, how much is your your liberty worth? Like, yeah. you're, you're guaranteed liberty in this country. It's not like, you know, and oh, you know what clip I could throw in here? Yeah is the uh, Brennan clip. Um, oh. You know, where he says, uh, you, we're going to find a better place to put this, but I'll just tell you what he said. Yeah. Um, you can believe me or not. You can look it up probably. Uh, but he says, uh, you know, in this country, uh, we believe that you're innocent until uh, alleged of have committing, <laughs> having committed a crime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, this is the this is a guy that was in charge of the CIA. Right? <laughs> Insane. You know where man. their mind is. Yeah. Um, and then... So the the last piece, and I think this is actually the most important piece, um, or, or certainly the one that we can spend the most time on, is just the charge of lying to the FBI. Ah, uh, yes. Actually, yeah. I want to throw one in there before that, um, okay. because it, it's come up again. Is that they, you know, they should have prosecuted them under the Logan Act. Oh, this you keeps know, the, coming. The Logan up. Act. This, this man. Uh, the lead up to Trump taking office, this like kept coming up, man. Yeah. Um, the, so the, the Logan act essentially says that, 
uh, a private citizen can't negotiate on behalf of the U S government with a foreign power or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not really ever been used. And I think it's anti-constitutional anyway, uh, because as far as I'm concerned, talk to whoever I want to. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But particularly in this case, the incoming national security advisor or secretary of defense or whatever it was that he was going to be, um, talking to an ambassador of a rival power. Yeah. <laughs> like I think it's perfectly reasonable. He he wasn't just some civilian yeah. out there m- making deals with Russia. He was the incoming national yeah. security advisor or secretary of defense. I can't yeah. remember which one. Um <laughs> Probably should have written that down. Right. <laughs> it seems In like that, that's, an, that's an important point. I didn't think mm. I would forget. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but the and then finally this last thing: lying to the FBI. Yeah. Um. As far as I'm concerned, this shouldn't even be a crime. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, to me, it just falls under free speech. I can say whatever I want to anybody. Yeah. Um. And but the other part of it and i i think this is the more important part this is the thing that i think hopefully will resonate with people mm. um is that uh i think it's a fifth amendment violation to have lying to the fbi as a crime uh i mean you already have obstructing justice and things like that that can you know if you're yeah. intentionally misleading them and getting in the way of an investigation that they can charge you with that but the fifth amendment says that you uh you do not have to incriminate yourself. Yeah. Okay. To me, that includes if I'm asked if I committed a crime, saying no. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, exactly. Like, I, that I can be accused of a crime for lying about whether I committed a crime or not is... <laughs> I don't know. It to me it just it gets in the way of the idea of being able to not incriminate yourself. Yeah. So you can um talk all you want about the truth, but then when they ask you if you did it and you don't say anything <laughs> I'm now. not gonna I'm not gonna answer that. Well you yeah. may as well have just said I did it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you in the uh, you know, what would they call it? The the exculpatory no yeah. I think is perfectly reasonable under the fifth amendment in terms of not incriminating yourself. Yeah. Um, you should be able to deny having committed a crime, even if you committed the crime, if you are allowed to, um, not incriminate yourself. Yeah. Does that make sense? It it makes sense to me. I mean, I, I did wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, now (laughs) what's kind of interesting is where these laws came from because they have expanded on their original purpose. Um, now it's just another way of charge stacking. Yeah. Um, as much as anything or just finding somebody. Well, uh, okay. So we know how these interrogations go anyway. Um, I, like I grew up with a guy who did interrogations. (laughs) Uh, so, um, there is a lot of tricks and one of those tricks is that they'll ask you the same question multiple times, but in different ways. Yeah. And it can be confusing. Yeah. Um, the next thing, one minute you, I mean, you could think you're being true, completely honest. And the mm-hmm. next thing you know, you've like contradicted yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, because you thought you were asking and answering a different question than you were. You're already under duress. Yeah. Um, Although I, I don't think that he was particularly under duress in this case. Yeah. But in this case, um, it was never intended to be used to prosecute somebody for misremembering. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I mean, um, that's, and that's really the problem, that, because this has been taken so far that you could like honestly misremember something, and the next thing you know, you're being prosecuted for it. Yeah. So. And that this was the only charge that they ended up bringing is kind of... Yeah. Anyway, uh, where this came from, I thought was kind of interesting when I, I started um, looking around. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that you sh- should be able to lie to any government official you want to, or any other person. I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't advocate lying, but I think that you should be able to do so. You, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> like part of being free, right? Yeah, and remember, the government officials supposedly... Uh, work for us. Mm. The representative That's the other of the half people. of that. So the police can lie to you whenever they want. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's and like I said, they absolutely encourage that, especially if they're trying to um, trip you up or whatever. Like they they openly lie to you. So that alone, if they can lie to me, 
I should be able to lie to them. That's mm. just the way I see it. Like equal playing field. Yeah. You, you know? I, I, I think that that's a good argument too. So the, um, the statutes or legislation or laws or rules or whatever yeah. um, about lying to government officials actually originated after the Civil War. Uh, they were used to prosecute people um, who were making false uh, liability claims, essentially, against the government. Yeah. Um, people that were uh, claiming losses from the war that didn't exist to <laughs> extract money from the federal government. <laughs> so that's what they were formed for in the first place. Yeah. Um, for the FBI, it was part of uh, applications. So there, you know, there would essentially be a cover page on applications that said, um, you know, to remind you uh, yeah. that it was an offense to lie to the FBI to prevent people from lying on applications and in um, entrance interviews, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Um, but, but it wasn't something was that it was prosecuted just, on. Yeah, that. it was yeah. just a threat. It wasn't yeah. anything that they were actually going to use for prosecution. It was just to try and limit yeah. people from <laughs> uh, like openly lying to get a job. Yeah. All right. So that's where this stuff came from. It was never intended for the use that it, it, it's being, for what it's being utilized for now. Oh, yeah. Um, which is, you know, charge stacking uh, to prosecute somebody for misremembering. Um, well, and it just seems like For that's... misanswering something because they didn't understand the question fully, uh, you know. Well, it's just a scary society to live in when, when you can be in the situation where, like, you can be put in an interrogation room and asked all kinds of questions, and if you contradict yourself, like, now they've got you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's very authoritarian. Yeah. Like, and, and that's, not where, that's not what this country is supposed to be about. Like, that's not, that's not what it was founded on. No, absolutely not. So. Um, I think that's it. I mean, that's really all I have about this. Um. Do you have anything you want to add or anything else you want to talk about before we no, I think, close I think, it out? I think we, we hit it on all cylinders pretty good. Pretty good? Pretty good. All right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, then we'll call it there. Uh, hopefully that satisfies the people out there that were calling for a podcast on the Flynn well, the, stuff. The Flynn deal was a big deal. Like there, this Because all of the stuff got put completely out in the open mm -hmm. with this. Like yeah. it, it really got it out in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, whether the media wants to pick up on it or not, it's it's been out there now. Yeah, well, it's back to that very authoritarian thing where the the political party in power is using the power of the government itself to um, hinder opposing parties. Yeah, uh, and you know this is exactly the thing, the kind of claims that people are making against Putin against Assad, against all these people that we we're supposed to hate around the world. Yeah. Um, and our government is doing it too. Yep, exactly. So that's all right there. Yep. Um, so, I mean, I hope, I hope that it encourages all of you to vote libertarian. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> because I assure you that a lot of these um, agencies... Well, I, will be severely curtailed, if not entirely eliminated. Yeah. Well, while that may be true, if you if we ever did have a libertarian elected, can you imagine the storm it would be? Because oh, I don't know that they would make it to office. I don't think they would either. I mean, there's no way because I mean, if they put <laughs> uh, if if the if the establishment, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, put up mm -hmm. this much of a fight against Trump. Being the outsider, yeah. can you imagine if a libertarian actually got in there? Yeah. Well, um, I will say, uh, no offense to them, but I am willing to martyr uh, Dr. Jorgensen and Spike Cohen. <laughs> you are, yeah. Well, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, you know, they, they want to take on you. Know, you want to run for you know president as risking. a yeah. You know what you're getting into, and that was the same thing with Ron Paul. Like Ron Paul was yeah. like, I mean, he knew what he was getting into when he started running for president yeah. after you know having the record he had yeah you know i mean you're you're taking on a lot yeah it's a well, big burden uh, the the scary thing is that all of this really um is about uh maintaining or persisting in these overseas wars yeah well that's uh, it, it it goes back to that it always does yeah um you know flynn uh didn't want to expand into syria and and he was opposed to the libyan intervention i think too yeah um well, and 
you know, and certainly like Trump's rhetoric on the campaign trail. And I hate that we have to fall back to, well, at least he hasn't started any new <laughs> wars. Well, but I mean, um, but that actually is a significant improvement over our last mini presidents. It is. But it, it goes back to something that Dave Smith has said quite a few times, and it just rings true so much. For all the people out there that hate Trump, just remember that the deep state and the FBI and the CIA, all of these groups that hate Trump too, that you mm -hmm. like root for. Yeah. They don't hate him for the same reasons you hate him. Right. <laughs> they hate him because of the wars and the stuff like that. That's mm -hmm. that's their their reasoning. It's not it's yeah. not that he says mean things. Mm -hmm. Like Yeah, I mean it's it's the the unfortunate symptom of government agencies that they have are always incentivized to fail. Yeah. Um, that the longer that they can maintain a problem, the more yeah. money they'll get. They, yeah. they have to justify their own existence. So the Defense Department doesn't want peace. Yeah. They want to maintain wars and expand wars and add new wars because the more of that they can get, the more money they can collect. Oh, man. There's a clip off Archer I'd like to clip one time and play on the show. Okay. If we, uh, yeah, I'll find it. I've got it at the house because every time I, I see that, probably have it too. Every time I see the episode, I just crack up, and it's like this. It's a whole couple of minute thing, but it, it's yeah. We'll play it on the show one day, just because I think it's hilarious. Well, um, when uh, after we sign off here, we'll see if we can find it. We, we'll see we if can... we can find it. I, it's in it's in a season. I don't think you have though. I don't uh, know which. If you have, I think it's the season four. I think I have that. Ah, if you have four, I'd love to insert that clip in here, just because okay. I think it's it's fitting into what we're talking about right now, as far as with the the FBI and the CIA and all okay. of that. Well, uh, you may get a clip right about here, or you may not. All right. <laughs> and uh, you know, with that, um, we will go ahead and close it out. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, hope you enjoyed the episode and learned something. Um, as always, follow us on Facebook. Subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, uh, like and share, uh, and share and share and share, <laughs> you know, as many shares as we can get, we you like know, that. all the better. <laughs> I, put it out in front of some more people. Um, and, uh, we'll, we're planning to be back here in a, actually. Next week could be tough for me for Friday. Uh, no, I should be good for, uh, well, We'll figure it out. But yeah. Friday actually may be tough. Yeah, we'll figure something out for next week. Uh, the ne the week after that, um, it may be me and somebody else because that's the convention ah, uh, weekend. Um, making dreams come true. But we'll yeah, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, you'll we're not done yet. Not yet. So we'll we'll be back for more when we manage to arrange it. <laughs> Sounds like. Um, in the meantime, uh, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.